Welcome to Chapter 16, Cosmology. Finally, <laughs> we've gotten to the last chapter in our course. <laughs> um, you might find this hard to believe. I didn't think we'd get here myself <laughs> with all the recording of lectures and everything. But we're here, and so congratulations to everyone for making it through the course. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and um, you know this will be the last uh, lecture you have to listen to me drone on about. Okay. So um, let's um, finish up the, uh, the course, and um, we'll do so by having um, a very interesting chapter to discuss and talk about. Um, cosmology is extremely interesting, and uh, I don't think I have to tell anybody that it deals with the fate of the universe. And, and in discussing that fate, we talk about a lot of different ideas and concepts that are uh, beyond our everyday experiences. And so it sounds a little weird at first. But if you, you know, keep an open mind and, um, you know, think about it, you know, we can find everyday analogies to a lot of the things that cosmologists study and, and um, think are going on with the universe at large. So uh, it's, it's in reality not really that far-fetched. It's just, again, some different way of looking at the universe than we're used to. Um, I opened up this image, or this chapter here, with uh, this image called the Ultra Deep Field. And it was taken with the advanced camera for surveys aboard the Hubble telescope. Um, again, it's a beautiful photograph that shows galaxies, not necessarily stars, but galaxies. and uh, all kinds of larger scale structures within the universe and it is one of the finest photographs of deep space uh, with the great re great resolution than, that we have ever made. Um, there's more than a thousand galaxies um, seen on this image and you, as you can see just by looking at it we have all different shapes and colors and uh, types so um, you know when taking a look at a picture like this or a few pictures like this we can take a look at the density of galaxies and other large-scale structures and astronomers can infer that there's about 100 billion galaxies within the observable universe okay so uh, but again a quite a beautiful picture in my opinion now in this chapter we're going to take a look at um, again the cosmology and what cosmology is, cosmology is a, a branch of astronomy in which the scientists who work in cosmology study the structure of the universe as a whole. And yes, they do have to be well grounded in the um, finer scale aspects of astronomy, you know, basically all of the things we've talked about in this course and then some. But they use that information and those techniques to try to understand the universe as a whole. And so with that in mind, we're going to take a look at the universe on the largest scale. That's what we've been working up to. Um, we're going to talk about how the universe is expanding and what that really means. The fate of the cosmos, it's one of you know those very interesting questions people like to sit around the dinner table or a campfire or a fireplace on a windy cold night and talk about these things. Um, then we'll discuss the geometry of space and talk about curved space, the different types of curved space, there's more than one, or possibly even flat space. And then the question of will the universe expand forever? And Einstein started a lot of discussion about this with his work in physics. Um, we haven't really touched on dark energy much in this course, not because it's not important or because we had a lack of interest. It's just, again, as you can see, astronomy is one of the oldest sciences and has so much material in it, we can't touch on everything. And so I've skipped it, <laughs> pretty much. But we'll just touch on it briefly in this chapter and the role it plays in uh, the fate of the universe. And then we'll wrap it up with a discovery made by two um, uh, Atlantic Bell employees in, in New Jersey back in the 60s that helped discover the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so that's the outline of our chapter. And so we're going to start off by taking a look at this map. <clears throat> this is a, a map of the galaxy, uh, a galaxy map. Um, and I want to point out here we have distance over here and redshift on this side and so distances we're dealing with a, a galactic map that has 1,000 uh, 1, megaparsecs which is basically about a billion parsecs out and so this is a, a very big map <clears throat> shows a tremendous amount 
placement of the universe and it has this um, scale here or a width of about 12 degrees um, uh, of the of the night sky um, from the celestial equator okay so um, it is still a small sliver of the sky when you consider the 360 degree expanse of the sky visible from the earth but it is the best we have at this point in time with the technology that we have at our disposal now there's um, a few um, dark areas on this map here. Um, what's interesting when you do look at this is that you see, you know, some void spaces, white areas, and spaces where you have dark areas, a lot of dust, or uh, galaxy clusters, or <coughs> whatever um, they are able to observe in in, um, cre in the creation of this map. And so, what you can see by looking at this map is the larger scale structure of the universe and you know um, you know what does the universe as a whole look like and there was actually uh, a quite an interesting special on uh, how the universe was formed the extended version or part two or whatever they call it that talks about what the universe looks like from the grand scale or from the big picture and it looks rather filamentous and there are knots and clots and densities of material and places and then there are holes in between other places and it looks very lacy and filamentous and so you can get a feel for that here when you take a look at this picture and so these darker areas here represent clots of matter and the largest structure that cosmologists have been able to see so far as a result of this survey is what we call the Sloan Great Wall and so you can see this extending across here and I suspect with uh, additional information and more resolution the Sloan Great Wall might extend a little further it gives the appearance that it might do that but at this point in time we've been able to measure what we see here is extending about 300 megaparsecs across the center of the frame and that with our current level of technology is the extent of what we are able to measure in the universe. We haven't really been able to pick up any structures larger than 300 megaparsecs at this point in time. Okay, but again that depends on technology. And As we improve our technology you never know what we'll be able to pick up later in the future. So, you know, this is really one of the first maps of the universe at a larger scale, so quite an achievement for humanity uh, in our ability to be able to create such a map. So we've come a long, long way since the days of Aristotle, certainly. Now there's another type of survey <coughs> that um, some uh, space agencies have been conducting, and this is what we call the pencil beam survey. And uh, here we just, you know, instead of taking a wide field of view, this is a very narrow field of view extending perpendicular to the um, galactic plane here. And so if you can see the number here, it says that um, we're looking at one quarter of a degree of sky <laughs> which is very very narrow but you know you can do a couple of these pencil surveys away from the earth and you know 360 degrees around the earth and um, you know eventually piece them together okay and so this is just another uh, option for how uh, we can view the universe and again when we even do the pencil surveys you know given the current levels of technology we don't have structures larger than about 200 300 megaparsecs Okay. So because of these surveys, um, cosmologists and astronomers have been able to say fairly confidently, I'm going to take a sip of coffee here, excuse me, <laughs> that the universe is homogenous. All right. And what homogenous means is that, you know, it's the same. It, it, there's no it change. So any 300 megaparsec square block looks just like any other 300 megaparsec scale block. And the universe is homogeneous on scales at large greater than about 300 megaparsecs. And so be mindful of that. When they say it's homogeneous, they're not speaking of homogeneity on the scales that we have been looking at so far in astronomy. The, gal the universe is not homogeneous in its, you know, in how galaxies are formed or in how solar systems are formed, how stars are formed. It is homogeneous on a very large scale. And, you know, we, again, we do have everyday analogies 
to, as to how this works. For example, you know, when you take a look at one human being or another, we're fairly homogenous. We have one head, two arms, two legs, a torso, a face. Everyone has two ears, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, hair. But, you know, the variations within that are tremendous. Some people have red hair, some have blonde, some have uh, uh, purple, depending on the Clairol bottle they're using. Some have blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, green eyes. Uh, was it Elizabeth Taylor? She had lavender eyes, I think, or something like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but you get the point. Um, you know, taking a look at the details of human beings, you come up with a great variety that allows people to be unique and look different from everybody else. But when you step back and take a look at the generalized features of human beings, we all have the same characteristics. And so the same is true of the universe. At the fine scale, there are details that make different parts of the universe very, very unique. But on the large scale, the universe is homogenous. One part looks just like everything else. The other thing is that the universe also appears to be isotropic. Now that is a word that means that it's the same in all directions. And so if you find galaxies looking north, you should find galaxies looking south, you should find galaxies looking east, find galaxies looking west. And so there's a similarity to what homogeneous or homogeneity and isotropism are, but there are differences too that people in the field have to know about when they measure the characteristics of matter. But for our purposes here, you know, you have the two words you're introduced and just realize that basically both of them mean that the universe at large scales is the same and looks the same and isotropy just has a distance uh, caveat to it. Okay, so, or I'm sorry, not distance, directional. All right, and so the fact that the universe at large scales is homogeneous and isotropic means that um, uh, we can develop what we call the cosmological principle. And so when a, uh, cosmologists do study the universe and try to understand the fate of the universe, the basic assumptions they are pinning all of their hard work to are the assumptions of isotropy and homogeneity. Okay, and so they do try in all of their hypotheses to make sure that the cosmological principle of those two assumptions is held at all times. And if their hypotheses and theories do not hold the cosmological principle, usually it gets rejected as a, as a result by the scientific community. Okay? Now what's interesting about this is that if the universe is homogeneous and if it is isotropic, uh, an astronomer by the last name of Olber, Olbers said that, well, if this is the case, then every time I look out into the night sky, eventually my eye is going to spy a galaxy or a star or something out there. And so this is illustrated in this picture here. So here's the Earth, and no matter which way you look from the Earth, you are eventually going to have your eyesight run into something. All right, and so this is what you should expect if you have a universe that truly is homogeneous, isotropic, infinite and unchanging. All right, but the fact of the matter is that's not, uh, I'm sorry, and so um, I jumped ahead there, I apologize. And so, um, so Olbers had said that if this is the case and that we look away from Earth and we can see stars and galaxies everywhere we look, then the sky should be bright all of the time, that it should just be filled with all of these luminous pieces of matter and we should never ever have a dark sky. Well, that's where the paradox comes in. And so everyone knows that when the sun sets, we have stars that twinkle in the sky and there's a tremendous amount of empty dark space in between all of the stars. And so, you know, the question is, why is this so? And so it's called Olber's paradox. Okay, and so we'll discuss that in a slide or two. All right, and so why is the, uh, why is the sky dark at night? All right. Well, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. We know that from the great sky surveys. We, you know, look out at different angles all over the universe and we see that this is true. But it is a big assumption to assume that the universe is infinite or that it's unchanging. Okay? And you know, just from everything we've learned in class so far this semester, you could at least turn around and say the universe is certainly not an unchanging place. You know, we have all kinds of processes going on in the universe, matter being created, when we have supernova, elements being created in the in 
in the uh, centers of stars, we have matter being destroyed in the centers of black holes. You know, there's a ton of things going on in the universe, so it isn't unchanging. Um, and, you know, infinity, does the universe extend out to infinity? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. We tend to think that it doesn't, that the universe does not extend out infinitely, but we don't know, really. All right, and so, um, so Olber's paradox basically highlights or, you know, points out to cosmologists that they have to be aware of the assumptions they're making. Homogeneity and isotropism are one thing, but you can't assume that if the universe is homogeneous and isotropic that it is unchanging or that it's infinite. And the fact that we have a night sky that's dark hints or shows the way that says that it is neither infinite or unchanging, that there is some kind of change going on in the universe. Now we have already found that galaxies are moving faster away from us the further away they are. Okay, and we've talked about this when we discussed galaxies and Hubble's law. All right, and so the recession velocity of galaxies and material in space is equal to the Hubble constant, which we already figured out, times our calculation of the distance. Okay, and we talked about some of the problems with that uh, because of the issues with Hubble's constant. Okay, and so how long did it take the galaxies, excuse me, to get where they are in the universe? Okay, now we're all familiar with the concept of velocity. If we're driving down the throughway, we're saying we're driving 50 miles per hour. And so anytime you measure speed, you're measuring distance with an aspect of time because what is the frame of reference for distance if you don't know how long it's taken you to go from point A to point B? And so if you're moving fast, you know there's a big difference between one mile per hour and 50 miles per hour. And so just by taking that velocity relationship of distance with respect to time, you can figure out time by just reversing around the characters of that equation. So if velocity equals distance times time, then time is equal to distance divided out by the velocity. And so if we know the distance to objects in space and the velocity at which they're receding from us is the Hubble constant times distance, all right, so you're substituting out velocity here, then 1 over Hubble's constant, because the two distance variables uh, cancel out here, 1 over Hubble's constant gives us a time for the universe of about 14 billion years. Okay, And so this is what we think is the age of the universe based on Hubble's constant. And so that gives us the indication that the universe is not infinite, that it hasn't been around forever, that it does have an age, a birth date, if you will, a born on date. And so it isn't an infinite entity because it does have somewhere uh, an edge to it, if you will. And so that is one of the reasons why Olber's paradox um, is the way it is, why we do have dark skies at night instead of uh, a daytime 24 hours a day. Okay. Now this is an interesting diagram that shows how the uh, universe is um, moving depending where you are in it. Okay, of course, all of our measurements are biased in that they are taken from one spot in the universe and only one spot, on the Earth itself or in close orbit around it. And so all of these observations that we are making, especially with how galaxies are receding from us, are made from that particular point of view, that perspective. Now, here is a diagram that shows what the universe will look like, how things are receding away from you if you're not on the Earth, if you're somewhere else, for example. And so here we have five different galaxies, all right, the third one here in the middle we're going to say is the Milky Way galaxy, but say this is Andromeda, say this is um, the Sombrero galaxy, it really doesn't matter. But you have four other galaxies in addition to the Milky Way to help, you know, give you a framework for how the universe is expanding. And so just taking a look at um, number three here, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, all right, what we have here is um, this is the view from our galaxy here. So if you're in this galaxy, um, you're basically moving at zero kilometers per second or zero mega 
uh, I'm sorry, zero megaparsecs. Everything else, you're in essence stationary. It harkens back to the um, uh, Earth at the center of the universe hypothesis. But you're zero here, and everything else is moving away from you. Okay, so if you're zero here, it looks like galaxy number two here is moving away from you at 700 um, kilometers per second per 100 megaparsecs. I'm going to shorten that down and just leave it to kilometers per second if you don't mind. <laughs> um, galaxy number one here is moving away from us at 14,000 kilometers per second. The same is true here in the opposite direction for galaxies four and five. But if you move to another galaxy, say galaxy number two here, okay, if you're here moving at zero kilometers an hour, then our galaxy here is moving away from galaxy number two at 7,000 kilometers per second. Galaxy number one is moving away at 7,000 kilometers per second. Galaxy number four is moving away at 4, 000, I'm sorry, 14,000 kilometers per second. But if you take a look at this, you'll notice there is a rhyme and a reason to these numbers. And so, again, going back to number three, which we say is our home galaxy, you know, the galaxies closest to us are moving away from us, but the velocity at which they're moving is slower than the galaxies beyond that, galaxies number one and number three. And that is the perspective from our point in space. But the same is true for the gal other galaxies in space. If you were sitting in galaxy number four, okay, they would appear to themselves to be moving at zero and everyone else around them is moving away and the further away they are, the faster they are moving. Okay, so it is an interesting little chart um, that kind of reminds us that you know, it doesn't matter where in the universe you are, all right, everything is moving away from you, okay, and so everything is moving away from three, uh, just the same as it is moving away from two, just the same as it is moving away from five, and so this harkens back to Einstein's relativity, and that's why it is called relativity, you know, there's the saying, everything is relative, well, what does that mean? It means it depends on your point of view, all right, and you know, at first, sounding that's like well that doesn't sound like a, a very good way to conduct science everything depends on your point of view well then science is everything to any, everybody well no not really because there are rules we follow what we're saying is that you know the physical properties of the universe around you you know are biased by your local perspective your point of view what you are seeing at that particular point in time it doesn't mean you're making up stuff you know on the whim um, so, you know, you know, depending on whether you're stationary on a planet, moving through planet on, uh, through space on the back of a comet, whether you're in another galaxy, whether you're stuck in a black hole, you know, the universe and how things are moving around you is going to vary depending on where you are, okay? And so, you know, one, again, one great example of how this works is if you're in a car driving down the throughway and you pass another car on the throughway. Well, to you sitting in your car, you feel you're, you're like you're not moving. You're sitting in your car and you know that you're driving 50 miles an hour. Your speedometer says so, but you sitting in the car don't really think you're moving 50 miles an hour. Your body thinks it's just sitting there still. That's the whole reason behind motion sickness. And so if you pass a car on the highway you know, it looks like from your perspective that that car is going backwards. Well, is that car really going backwards? No, it's your perspective that they're going backwards because you pass them. The people in the other car who are sitting there going 45 miles an hour look at you and say, what a speed demon. You're just, you know, cruising up, you know, the, the throughway at a gazillion miles an hour, you know, not regarding anybody else. And so again, you know, it's your perspective depending on the frame of reference that you are in. And so this is the beginnings of relative thought. And when you're dealing with universe as large as ours is, you know, you have to consider the frame of reference you're in. Okay. And so, um, so when we do speak of cosmology, we are touching on relativity and how things appear depending where on the universe you are. And so with this chart, again, this is just a neat way to remind us all of that and to just point out, okay, you know, if you're in your home galaxy, you know, what you're seeing from here is the same as what this person is seeing from here and the same as what this person is seeing from here and all over.
okay? So just an interesting little chart, you know, pay attention to some of the numbers, see how they're varying, you know, depending on, on what's going on. And, you know, and, and notice that the variation between the different columns here is not random, that there still is um, a rhyme and a reason to it. Okay? Now, um, we've shown on the previous slide that depend, no matter where you are in the galaxy, or in the universe, I'm sorry, the universe is expanding away from you. Whoops, just hit the microphone. I apologize again. And so, if the universe is expanding away from you as we go through time, it isn't a big leap in the imagination to think, well, if you reverse time and you stop the movie camera and reverse it, well, then the expansion should go to a contraction and everything should start to come back and pull back together. And that is what cosmologists think, that if you take the universe's ex ex expansion and extrapolate it backwards in time, everything in the universe, all the galaxies, all the matter in the universe will just come back and crunch down to a single point 14 billion years ago. And that single point is what we call uh, the location of the Big Bang. Okay, this was, uh, a, it still is a hypothesis for how our universe was formed. And so the idea is that all matter, all energy was condensed down to a single point that we call in the, in the field a singularity. And then an explosion occurred that just ejected all energy and matter away from the singularity in, in an explosion that we call the Big Bang. Okay? And so the beginning of the universe started with the Big Bang, we think, and has been expanding away from that singularity point ever since. And so next the question would be, well, where was the Big Bang? And so some of you may think, well, you just answered it. You said it was this point in space, the singularity. Well, that is true. But where in our universe itself was this singularity? Well, the answer is, it was everywhere. There really is no point in the universe that you can say everything contracts back to this point. Um, this is where we start to have some mind-bending experiments here a little bit, and you've got to give it a little bit of thought. Um, it, you know, you have to remember that the universe is everything. All matter, all energy that we talk about in this course and in any other science course, geology, physics, chemistry, is part of the universe. And you have to kind of close your mind off, really. In our discussions in this class, there is nothing outside of our universe. Everything is in our universe. And so if you collapse the universe down and you tuck all matter, all energy into a singularity, into a singular point, everywhere is at that point. Everything is at that point. All energy, all matter, all time is at that point. You're just squished down to a teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny um, particle of matter at that one point. It's kind of like an episode or from the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> you just shrink everything down. And so, in essence, the Big Bang was everywhere as the entire universe was involved in the explosion, okay? And so, there really is, you know, we talk about the singularity, but there really isn't a point in space from which everything exploded. The whole universe just exploded, if you will, at the beginning of the Big Bang. So, no matter where in the universe we are, as a result, we will measure the same relationship uh, between recessional velocity and distance with the same Hubble constant because the entire universe was involved in the Big Bang. Okay, so um, just wanted to set that up for you and start to get you guys thinking about, um, you know, some concepts that are, again, just a little bit outside of our everyday experience. Okay, now um, I always liked using balloons to help explain the expanding universe, okay? And so to me it just really helps show how this works. And so here we have a, a slide that has three balloons on it, or one balloon, they're just expanded differently. And so the balloon is the universe, okay? You don't have to worry about anything outside of the balloon. The balloon here, the surface of the balloon, contains everything that we need to be worried about in the universe. 
and so uh, the balloon represents the universe. And then taped onto the balloon are these coins. Now I should backtrack for a second here and explain. You know, when we talk about an expanding universe, it really is the universe, the fabric of the universe itself, that is doing the expanding. The individual components within the universe are not expanding with it. We're along for the ride, to be sure, but you know, if I'm putting on a little bit of middle age spread, I can't blame an expanding universe for it. It's because I'm eating a little too much pasta with dinner. I have an Italian husband after all. <laughs> so, um, you know, but galaxies don't expand with the universe. Planets don't expand. Stars don't expand. So again, the expansion of the universe is a phenomenon that occurs at the scale of the universe, at a very large scale. We don't have individual atoms and elements and nuclei, nuclei and electrons expanding with the universe. They are kind of embedded with you in the universe and along for the ride. And so that is what is seen here with this balloon experiment. So if you take the balloon here with the coins on it and you blow the balloon up, the coins themselves don't expand, but the space around them expands. And so from balloon A to balloon B here, you notice that the, if, if you could take the middle coin here as being Earth or the Milky Way galaxy, that the galaxies around it are closer to you, but as you blow up the balloon and expand it, now they are moving away from you. All right, and then if you expand it even more, the coin galaxies have moved away even more. So again, the coins themselves aren't expanding, they're along for the ride, but the space in between them is expanding. This is exactly how the universe operates. So the universe around us is expanding, the space between the galaxies and other objects in the universe is getting wider and longer, but the galaxies, the solar systems, the planets, the nebulae, the supernova, the comets, everything in the universe is not expanding along with it. Okay, But, you know, again, I really like this example. You know, it just shows very well how the coins are here along for the ride and as you blow the balloon up and the balloon keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, the space between these coins gets bigger and bigger. And then the reverse is true. If you wanted to go back in time to the big breath which started the expansion of the balloon, you just slowly let the air out of the balloon, it'll contract back, and then the galaxies, the coins, will start to come closer together, and they are no longer receding, but they are contracting back to the original point from which they started. Okay, so that's really, if you're going to think about expansion of the universe, that's how you have to think about it. Another thing you need to remember is that I pointed out that the center coin here was, you know, the Milky Way galaxy, and that's all well and good, but what if you were on the penny on the top here? Well, the penny on the top here, and you, you move to point B here, you know, all the galaxy coins around it are moving away, and the same is true here. So again, you know, everything is moving away from everything else, okay? It doesn't matter which coin you're on, everything is moving away, okay? Now this is um, another uh, balloon analogy, but instead of talking about galaxies, we're going to talk about ultra, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And I hinted in our last lecture on galaxies about a new way of looking at the Doppler shifts that we've been discussing all semester long. And this is where we talk about that. Okay. And so what we have here are three balloons that represent an expanding universe. And if this is the beginning of the universe, we have electromagnetic radiation that has a wavelength in the blue spectrum of visible light. Now, again, you have to remember that, you know, the coins are embedded on the universe balloon and they are expanded, the, the coins are along for the ride as the balloon expands. Well, electromagnetic radiation is part of the matter-energy connection. So when we speak of all the contents of the universe, we're not speaking just of matter, but of energy associated with matter. You have to remember in Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, that energy and matter are supposed to be uh, convertible. It's kind of like wearing one of those jackets you can wear one, so one side one day and then turn it around the next day and wear it inside out, and it just looks like a different jacket, but re in reality it's the same jacket. 
Well, it's the same thing. Matter and energy are the same thing. You can convert matter to energy and you can convert matter uh, energy back into matter given different kinds of processes in the physical world. And so if electromagnetic radiation is also part of the universe, and if the universe is expanding, then as the universe expands, it's going to pull the electromagnetic radiation apart, in essence lengthen its wavelength, and therefore cause a shift in the color of the electromagnetic radiation that you're looking at. And so here we start off with blue electromagnetic radiation, and because we've expanded the universe, we've pulled the wavelength apart, and as a result now it looks a little orange. And here we've expanded the universe even more and pulled the wavelength apart even further, and now you have EM radiation in the red spectrum. And so the shift, the Doppler shift that we've been talking about all semester long, is measuring the expansion of the universe. It is measuring how fast that expansion is occurring and how far away that expansion is. Um, you know, in a part of the universe that has, is further, you know, if this is the beginning, you know, this part of the universe is much expanded. There's more distance between the, the boxes, you know, the intersections of the lines on the grid here in this balloon than there is in this balloon. So that's given the appearance that the distance has increased, and it has, but it's, the universe has expanded. And so what I'm trying to get to, and maybe not so well, um, is that when we measure blue shifts and red shifts, We've been talking all semester long about how we're move, measuring velocity, how an object is moving away from us, moving towards us. And that's really a simplification of what's really going on. What we are measuring when we measure blue shifts and red shifts in Doppler are the expansion of the universe. And so we're actually taking wavelengths and expanding them, and then they give you a different color experience as a result. Okay, and so this is the reason why when astronomers start talking about universe structures that are 100 megaparsecs or larger, that they tend to stop using distance. Part of it, again, has to do with uh, some of the trouble we've had with the Hubble constant, but part of it comes from the realization that um, the shifting in the radiation is due to the expansion of the universe. And when you're dealing with structures that are the size, very large sizes in the universe, you know, it doesn't really make sense anymore to sit there and talk about how many billions of gigaparsecs things are away from each other. You just start talking about how redshifted they are. Because really what you're talking about is what's the waistline of the universe. All right, so if you have a redshifted, you know, object, it's been, you know, it's part of the universe that's expanded a tremendous amount, whereas if an object is blue shifted, it hasn't, it's part of the universe that hasn't expanded that much at all. And so, you know, again, when cosmologists and astronomers start talking about objects that are very, very far away, objects that are very, very old, objects that um, have been around since the beginning of the universe. If you have quasars, for example, that are thought to be 12 billion years old, well, their light is tremendously redshifted because the radiation that we're receiving from those objects has been traveling through space for 12 billion years in a universe that's expanded for that many years and more. And so uh, all of the radiation from that object is now redshifted. All right, and so I... Uh, promised you <laughs> we would take a look at the Doppler shift, uh, the blue and red shifts a little differently by the time we got to this lecture, and and so this is what I was referring to. So if you have any questions, you know, email me, let me know, um, but um, if you think about it a little bit, I think you can see, you know, what astronomers are talking about. All right, and so yes, you know, again, these concepts are hard to comprehend they're not necessarily intuitive, all right? And if you really want to understand all of this stuff, you want to get into mathematics and physics and start learning about general relativity, and then you really pull your hair out. Um, but, you know, we're going to continue to explain things using simpler Newtonian mechanics that we're familiar with, you know, every day here on Earth, so don't worry. All right, now that leads us to our first uh, concept check. Why does Hubble's law imply a Big Bang? 
right? So we'll review the slides we just went over, and then I think you'll have a, a fine time answering that question. All right, and so we've been talking about what the universe has been doing, how it's been expanding. I'm going to take another sip of coffee. Excuse me for a second. Obviously, if I'm drinking coffee, it must be early in the morning <laughs> when I'm giving this lecture. Um, we're still having trouble with Blackboard here, so I wanted to get this done early to see if I can get it up for you guys. But uh, at any rate, getting back to this, so, you know, we've been talking about how the universe is expanding, and so I guess the next logical question is, well, where's the universe going? What's going to happen to it? And what's the fate of it? And so really, there are two possibilities. Okay, if the universe is expanding, it could keep expanding forever. All right, it's been expanding for... If the universe is 14 billion years old, it's been expanding for the past 14 billion years. All right, you know, they say a tiger never changes its stripes. Well, after 14 billion years, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> so, you know, it's probably in all likelihood that the universe will, you know, expand forever. But, you know, to consider the complete picture of things, the option does exist that the universe could also stop expanding and start to come back in. You know, because if you think about it, how, how long can you keep blowing up that balloon? You know, at some point, doesn't the energy peter out? You know, does it, you know, come back in on itself? Okay, so these are the two possibilities. Now, in order to consider, you know, the options and figure out what we think really is going to happen, you know, the only really relative force that's controlling how far this expansion goes is gravity. You know, gravity is an attractive force and it pulls matter together. And the more matter you have, the more gravity you have. Well, what we're talking about here is a universe full of matter. Okay, that's a lot of matter. So at some point, you think gravitational attraction would put the brakes on this expansion and then cause the universe to collapse. Well, that depends. It depends on, well, how much matter is a universe full of matter? Does the universe full of matter, is it, like some people's closets where it's just chock full of stuff. You know, I have a seven-year-old at home right now whose concept of cleaning up his room is to shove everything in the closet. And so that closet is jam-packed. All right, so do we have a similar situation with the universe where it's just jam-packed full of matter? Or is it a situation where it's like mommy's closet and it's nice and organized and the winter clothes are put away and the winter shoes are put away and so my closet is airy and it doesn't have as much matter in it. <laughs> and that refers to density, all right? How much matter is packed in the universe, all right? And so whether the universe will keep expanding or not depends on how dense it is, okay? Now here's an interesting chart that kind of plots what's going to happen depending on whether you have high density matter or low density matter in the universe. And so we have distance on the y-axis here, time on the x-axis here, and right here is where the Big Bang is thought to have occurred. Okay, and the present time is listed here. So if you have a universe that has low density, all right, it has my closet, which I don't have everything jam-packed in there, it's just a few things I need for the season. If you don't have matter jam-packed into every nook and cranny of the universe, then the gravitational attraction is going to be less, because gravitational attraction is highly dependent on how much matter you have. And so if you have a low-density universe, you may not have enough gravitational attraction to pull, put the brakes on. And so if that's the case, the universe is going to expand forever. And so that's represented by this blue line here. And so it's basically just saying, here's the Big Bang. And because you have a low density universe, as time goes by, it's just going to keep getting expanding and the distance will keep getting greater and greater. And it'll just continue like this forever and no worries. Now, if you have Rocco's kind of closet for a universe, where all kinds of Star Wars and Transformers and puzzles and coloring books are jam-packed into the closet, well, that high-density matter has tremendous gravitational attraction. And so that will put the brakes on expansion. And so that's represented here by this pink line or semicircle curve here. And so you see the Big Bang here. It is a semicircle, so it has a given rate, uh, diameter here. And so we start the Big Bang right here. This represents expansion, uh, material moving away from the Big Bang. This is the present time. And so it will continue to expand as time goes on. And then eventually the brakes will get put on and then it'll start to collapse 
over time and distance will start to get smaller until you come back down here. Okay? And so these are, you know, just a way of graphing the two different fates of the universe depending on the big question, how much stuff is thrown into the universal closet. Okay? And what we need to figure out is what is the critical density? How much stuff can you cram into the closet before you go and hit that trigger that's going to start collapsing? And that's what we call the critical density. That's the density of matter that determines whether or not you're going to expand forever or start to collapse. Okay? As um, if you have density, if you have enough matter in the universe to be at the critical density, the universe will expand forever. But what happens is the expansion speed will just asymptotically approach zero as time goes on. So the speed will start to slow down over a while, but it will never get to zero. It will just continue to expand. Okay. And so given the present value of the Hubble constant, that critical density has been calculated as 9 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms per cubic meter. That's about 5 hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. That's not a lot. That's a pretty low density if you think about it. You have a cubic meter of space and all that's in that space is 5 hydrogen atoms. That's a lot of space. Okay, so you don't need to have a tremendous amount of mass in the universe to be at that critical density point. And so the question is, well, what is the universe's density? Are we at the critical point? Are we below it? Are we above it? Well, that's the million dollar question, if you will. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the shape of the universe here, okay? Um, because um, this has impacts on whether or not we'll have continued expansion or contract. Now, if space is homogeneous, okay, there are three possibilities for its overall structure. All right, you can have a universe that is closed, okay, and this is the geometry that leads to ultimate collapse. And a closed universe basically refers to a universe that is spherical. All right, it's like being on the inside of the balloon or being inside of a beach ball. If you have enough matter, gravitational attraction will cause the universe to kind of wrap around itself and close up. And so you need to have a tremendous amount of matter in the universe for it to wrap around and close in on itself. And if you have that much amount of matter in the universe, then you have exceeded the critical density and the universe will eventually collapse. But we call that kind of spherical universe a closed universe, um, but it is kind of shaped like uh, a beach ball. The other option is you can have a flat universe, all right? This is where there's just enough matter, it's at the critical point where gravitational attraction doesn't cause the universe to collapse in on itself. It is just flat and it just extends out forever. The last option is what we call an open universe. Okay, now the best way to see this is to take a look at the closed universe and flip it around. So in a closed universe, you have so much matter that the universe just kind of closes in and pulls itself into a sphere, into a ball. But if you have so little matter, the universe will then kind of, you take that beach ball and unfurl it. And then you just t kind of take it and turn it upside down. Uh, actually, in reality, the best way to look at it is to th think of an umbrella. All right, you know, usually you have a nice big umbrella on a rainy day and it's curving over your head and protecting you from the rain. That curvature of the umbrella you can think of as the curved, as the closed universe. It's just wrapping around you. But then if you have this big gust of wind and the wind goes underneath the umbrella and pushes the umbrella inside out, that's exactly what an open universe kind of looks like. It just unfurls and just uh, is, doesn't close in on itself in the top. It just unfurls and kind of looks like a saddle or a bowl with the edges of the bowl extending into inter-universe space forever. And so that's what we call an open universe, and it does expand forever. 
Now, of course, we are familiar with the flat concept living here. We do live on a spherical planet, but you know, the sphere is large enough that when we take a look at our little postage stamps, it looks flat. And so we use a geometry every day. It's called Euclidean geometry. And we learned about it in high school, even though your high school teacher may not have told you it was called Euclidean geology, uh, geometry, I'm sorry. But um, it is the geometry of sp flat spaces. And so all triangles on flat spaces have angles that add up to 180 degrees. Right angles are 90 degrees, things of that nature. When you have a closed universe, that is a type of um, geometry called Riemann, Riemannian <laughs> geometry. And some of you, if you've ever taken calculus, may have learned or remember your Riemann sums. It's the same person. But, you know, that's a geometry that deals with uh, the intersection of angles and lines on, on spheres. And believe it or not, we do use this type of geometry in our everyday experience. Um, if you consider, if you're a navigator or an engineer, when you're flying an airplane across the planet, you may have heard that airplanes have to take a great circle route. That's the shortest distance between two points on a sphere because you're dealing with the, the distance is large enough to be impacted by the curvature of the planet. So uh, when you're flying a plane, a straight line between London and New York isn't on a, plan, on, a, on a sphere, the shortest distance between them, it's the great circle route. And so that's an example of this Riemann, Riemannian ge uh, geometry and what you're dealing with, um, you know, how angles and lines are represented on a sphere. And then there's a third type of geometry that deals with the open um, type of universe, the saddle shape. And I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I don't recall the name of the mathematician who figured it out. It's fairly recent, uh, and he's Russian. And so um, I, I don't, it's, it's outside of my everyday experience. I don't remember the gentleman's name, but it's a different type of geometry altogether. And so, you know, depending on the shape of the universe, the mathematics is going to change as a result. All right, and so, you know, the shape of the universe has a lot riding on it you know, in terms of how we describe it, in terms of its fate, but, you know, this is, you know, the shape, the three basic options for the shape of your universe. Either it's closed or spherical, it's flat the way uh, Columbus would have liked it, or it's open and it looks like uh, an inverted umbrella or a saddle, if you will. Okay. And again, the three, as I've indicated already, I think I got ahead of myself a little bit, the three possibilities for the shape of the universe um, depend, of course, again, on the critical density. Now, the astronomers have given critical density the, the sign here of omega, I believe that is. looks like a horseshoe, all right? And uh, it's kind of fitting. The end of things is omega, <laughs> so the alpha and the omega. Um, and so, um, so this is the sign for critical density uh, if you put a zero on it. So critical density is omega zero, all right? And so how we describe the three shapes of the universe uh, with respect to the critical density is if you have, I'm going to go with the sphere first because we've been doing that, a closed geometry where the universe has a sphere, the critical density is greater, uh, the density, I'm sorry, the density of the universe is greater than the critical density. If you have a flat universe, then they're saying that the density of the universe is exactly equal to the critical density. And if you have an open universe in which you have that saddle shape, the density is less than the critical density. So this is how we explain it in terms of, you know, mathematical relationships here. Okay? So moving on here. And you know, some of the implications um, for, you know, closed versus flat versus open universe. Here we have a picture of the globe of the Earth. Okay? And, you know, the Earth is a sphere, and this represents fairly well the closed universe, if you just think of the Earth as being the universe, and that's not a far leap for us. It's, you know, everything that keeps us alive is on this universe we live on here, all right? But in a closed universe, if this is a sphere, okay, this is where I was saying before, like with airplanes, you know, you can travel in a straight line, but, you know, that straight line technically is curved, all right? It's a great circle around the sphere. And so if you're here, and you walk across the surface of the Earth, because it's a sphere, by the time you get around the Earth, you will eventually end up where you started. You will have sworn 
you just walked in a straight line. He was like, I don't understand this. How did I end up back where I was? I just kept walking in a straight line and voila, here I am. Okay, the analogy they're using here is light. So the lady is flashing light uh, just straight in space, but the light travels around the earth and comes and hits her in the back again. All right, and the fact of the matter is you did travel in a straight line. You didn't diverge, you didn't go anywhere. What was different is that the universe you were in was closed. And because you're confined by the universe you're in, your straight line in essence really is a belt around the sphere or a circle around the sphere. Okay, and so you will end up back exactly where you are. And if you think about it, this has implications for the universe as well, because if we were to send out a spaceship or send out a beam of light, eventually if the universe is closed, that beam of light will make its way back to the universe and you'll see it coming in from behind you again. So, um, you know, so that is the implications of a closed universe. And so, you know, think about it again in terms of the earth and the lady walking and it starts to make a little bit more sense and then just, you know, expand it out to the universe for yourself. All right, we kind of covered this already. I forgot I put this more precisely slide in this, so I'm sorry. But again, you know, here are the three possibilities for the overall geometry. Here's the closed universe. It's a spherical geometry, what we call uh, Riemann, Riem I'm going to have trouble with that, Riemann geometry. I'll just make it easy for myself. If we have flat space, we have Euclidean geometry. You have your triangle here that sums to 180 degrees. Uh, when you have positive curvature, the sums of the angles of a triangle are greater than 180 degrees. And then here we have the uh, open universe. Here it is, Lobachevsky geometry. That's the name of the mathematician who developed that kind of geometry. And so he calls this a negative curvature, all right? And so the sums of angles are less than 180 degrees. Okay, but these, you know, are just the various possibilities of the universe. And again, it is important for us to figure out what universe we have because the mathematics behind it are different. And so we can't figure out, you know, what our fate is in the universe unless we know what kind of universe we are because th the type of universe you're in has a set of rules that are different uh, from the other two. Okay, so it is important for us to figure this out. Okay. And now on to our second concept check. How is the curvature of space related to the density of the universe? That should be pretty easy for you guys to answer. Okay. Now moving on. All right, so this leads us to discuss will the universe expand forever? Okay, and so we understand now that the answer to this question lies in the density of the universe and how much matter is in the universe. Now, if we were to take measurements on all the matter that we see through our telescopes, we call that luminous matter. You know what luminosity is at this point. All right, and so all the matter that we see, if we were to map all the universe, okay, that would suggest that the actual density of the universe is only a few percent of the critical density. But we know that there must be large amounts of this thing called dark matter, okay, and we call it dark matter because it is matter we cannot see. It is not visible. Uh, it does not uh, exhibit any kinds of electromagnetic radiation that we can see given um, the technology we have today. We know of its existence because it impacts things around it. So it's, it's kind of like gravity. We know that there's gravitational attraction because when we have a baseball in our hand and we let it go, it falls to the ground. We don't see the gravity, we don't feel it with our hands and our feet and our arms, unless you're doing push-ups, then you feel it, or sit-ups. But you know, when you let go of that baseball, you know that baseball drops. You know that the gravity is there. And so that is our level of understanding right now with dark matter. We can't measure it. We can't see it. We don't have the technology yet. But we know it's there because it does influence things around it. And so we're just still working on trying to figure this thing out. And so when we take a look at the amount of matter in the universe, we have to consider the luminous matter as well as the dark matter. All right, you know, in this kind of a dance, you have to consider all the partners. It isn't just one or two. If you want to figure out the density of the universe, you really got to catalog everything in it. All right, and you can't leave anything out. Okay, now the best estimates for the amount of dark matter that is, you know, tending to bind galaxies and clusters and explains things that we haven't discussed like gravitational lensing and stuff like that. 
still only brings up the observed density to about 0.3 times the critical density. <clears throat> and so it seems very unlikely that there could be enough dark matter to make the density critical. Hmm. So what does that say? <laughs> so type 1 uh, supernovas have been used to measure the behavior of distant galaxies. And so the idea is, is that if we don't have enough density in the universe, um, we should expect the expansion to be decelerating. It should be slowing down, okay? And uh, as it would be if gravity was the only thing acting on it, okay? So the furthest galaxies have had a more rapid recessional speed in the past, and it appears as though they are receding faster than Hubble's law would predict. Well, that's interesting. All right, so just again to repeat, if we don't have enough mass in the galaxy, we would expect that it would start collapsing. And so we would expect that the further out we go into space, the galaxies should be, they could still be moving away from us, but they should be moving away from us at a lowering speed. And that is not the case. All right, we have made observations using the supernova and other um, deep space objects to measure the behavior of material at you know, the edges of our observable universe that shows that the universe as it is receding from us is actually getting faster and it's moving faster than Hubble's law is predicting. Okay, and so here we have a, a graph here that uh, shows how some of this works. On these graphs here, I will zoom in so you can see them better. We have distance on the x-axis in megaparsecs. We have the amount of redshift here, and the, the top number for redshift is 1 right here, and here's 0, the bottom number. And we have a series of lines. Now there's a black line on here. I will again zoom in for you. Well, you know what? Let's see if I can do that now. Let's see if I have to keep it within. I hope this is the best I could zoom in for you guys. I'm sorry. All right, but um, if you, you know, download the PowerPoint yourself and zoom in yourself at home on your computer, you can see the different lines that I'm talking about here. And so there's a black line here that represents how the universe should be acting according to the Hubble constant. All right, and so in a decelerating universe, which is the purple and red curves, all right, the red shifts of distant objects are greater than would be predicted by Hubble's law. And the reverse is true for an accelerating universe. All right, and so when we take a look at these plots here, we plotted several supernova. They are not plotting along the decelerating red and pink lines. They are plotting below the black line here for an accelerating universe. Okay, and so again, if we calculate all the luminous matter in the universe and all the dark matter using Hubble's constant, Hubble's equations, we should be having a decelerating universe. But when we actually look at objects in deep space and try to measure them, what we are showing is that they're not, you know, the universe isn't decelerating, it's actually accelerating. It's getting, the expansion is getting faster. And so, of course, what I'm hinting at is that this represents a problem, that, you know, something is wrong with what we're figuring out here. Either we have miscalculated the mass, or there's something up with Hubble's equations, you know, there's something wrong here. And so this acceleration can't be explained by our current theories of the universe, but what we do know, it is not caused by either matter or radiation or anything in the universe um, that we have figured out to date. And so we have to continue to work on it and try and figure out what's going on here. But, you know, direct observations of objects in the very, very deep space far field from a show that the universe is accelerating. It's not decelerating. And so it's an interesting, you know, take a look at this graph here just to see that. The pictures here just represent some of the supernova, excuse me, excuse me, supernovae pictures that, you know, were used to plot the graph. That's all. Okay, and so the, what we have kind of figured out in order to start to explain this is that dark energy, we, again, we still don't understand it. We just know of its effects on matter around it. 
dark energy tends to act a little bit like the opposite of gravity. Okay, gravity is attractive. It pulls matter together. Dark energy, we feel, has a repulsive effect that increases as the universe expands. And so we have a universe in which we have matter that has gravitational attraction that's always trying to contract and pull the universe back to its original configuration. But we also have this dark force, this dark energy that counteracts that gravitational attraction and is causing matter to repulse away uh, and, and counter, you know, counter to gravity. And so right now this is what we are thinking explains why the universe is accelerating away, that this dark energy affiliated with the dark matter is repulsive in nature. Again, we don't really understand this energy and how it works, but there is something in the universe that we're still trying to understand that is causing it to expand faster and faster against gravity. Okay, And so we feel that is the reason why or our first attempt at explaining why it is that when we take a look at supernova and other deep sky objects that their acceleration is increasing instead of decreasing over time. And so, you know, as we continue to work on it, check back in from time to time. Um, we'll see what advances have been made, but this is just one of those questions right now that we have these observations, but we really don't know how to explain them yet. Okay, but the fact is the universe is accelerating and it's getting faster the further away we go instead of decelerating. All right, and so given what we've discussed so far, why do astronomers think the universe will expand forever? All right, feel free to, to comment on what astronomers don't know. That's really very important because it is part of science. You know, what we know is important, but what we don't know is important, and it's only by thinking about what we don't know that we come up with answers to our questions. Okay, so it's important to highlight those things as well. All right, and so this comes to um, a little bit of a discovery thing here I threw in here related to Einstein. It's actually uh, kind of funny, um, but it's, it's the uh, Einstein and the cosmological constant. All right, in order to help explain, explain this repulsive force that's working against gravity, um, Einstein came up with something called the cosmological constant or vacuum energy. And it was originally introduced by Einstein to prevent, him, for, to prevent his theory of general relativity from predicting a static universe would collapse. All right, um, you got to remember that at the time of Einstein, when he, they were working um, back in the early 1900s before World War II, when Einstein and his peers were working on their concepts for the universe and general relativity, they assumed at the time that the universe was static, that they that it did not change. All right, and this this was not you know uh, a problem at the time. They did not have the technology we have today. They didn't know the things we know today, and so you know this was before even Hubble. Hubble didn't start working on galaxies yet, and so astronomers and physicists at the time thought that the universe didn't evolve. They didn't know about the expansion of the universe, and it wouldn't be discovered for another 10, 20 years. Okay, so they believed that the universe was static, but Einstein's equations kept pointing to the fact that the universe wasn't static and in some ways it's it's a little bit amusing but it's also a testimony to the power of really good science. Um, Einstein really was constrained by the thought of the day. He had no reason to think that the universe was expanding or changing and so it was inconceivable to him for his equations to show that it was. And so he was embarrassed by this and you know it shows that even the greatest minds are fallible. And so what he did is he developed this cosmological constant or vacuum energy that uh, would prevent general relativity from showing that the universe would change or would collapse. Um, when several decades later they did discover, thanks to Hubble and his work, that the universe was changing, that it was expanding, Einstein was embarrassed and he had to remove the constant from his theories and he went around saying it was the biggest blunder of his career. But 
funny enough again, as it turns out, uh, here we are in the 21st century, um, he put this cosmological constant into his equations to prevent them from showing a changing galaxy. Um, and then, you know, took them out when they found out the galaxy, I'm sorry, the universe, the universe, is where the universe was changing. Um, it may turn out now that we have need for this cosmological constant after all. <laughs> and so cosmologists and astronomers are now using it again to help explain, you know, what's going on with dark energy in the universe. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny how, you know, Einstein's practice here and, and his rescind rescinding of what he did, uh, you know, his little blurring of the lines here might actually turn out to be something important and relevant anyway. So just a little uh, humorous aside, I'm sure Einstein wouldn't have thought it was so funny. He didn't. But, you know, hindsight is very interesting, you know, perspective, you know, we can take a look at things from the past. All right. But at any rate, the point here is, you know, Einstein introduced this cosmological constant in order to, you know, help his uh, theories, you know, show that the universe was pretty much you know, not expanding. And we have need for that now actually to show that, you know, it is expanding. Okay? And so, yep, I got ahead of myself again. So, you know, it seems as though something like the cosmological constant may be necessary to explain that. Uh, but again, that theoretical work is still at the very early stages. Okay? So, you know, that leads us to support, well, or to ask, you know, what else supports the dark energy theory? You know, what else have we got, you know, to show that this stuff is real and it's not, you know, a figment of our imaginations, okay? So, you know, in, you know, some of the assumptions we can think about is that in the very early life of the universe, the geometry must be flat, you know, when you first start off. And the assumption of a constant expansion rate predicts that the universe may be actually younger than what we observe. Okay, so here we have a graph to illustrate all of this. Here we have on the x-axis time in terms of billions of years. Here on the y-axis we have the size of the universe. Okay, and so this is the present time. This is where we are. Um, this is where we had globular cluster formation. Here zero is the beginning point of the universe. And you're looking at, um, let me see here, 5 billion years out, 10 billion years out. This is the present time at 14 billion years. And then um, who knows how far out you can extend it, extend it. All right, the first two lines here you've seen already. So if we had a closed universe, this is what you would expect of the universe and how it would behave. If you had a closed universe with more mass than the critical density, more density than the critical density, the universe will expand up to a certain point and then start to close in on itself. If you had a universe that had reached critical density, all right, then you would have the line come up here and then just asymptotically approach zero over time, but continue to expand. If you had low density, then the blue line here would just show that it would just continue off forever. Okay. Now if you had empty space, that's the black line here. But what we are seeing is that we have an accelerating universe. And so that line is represented here by this green line here. And so you see that the universe is moving in this direction and the size of the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger because it's accelerating over time. All right. And so when we trace these curves back, all right, what it shows us is that the age of the universe works out to be about 13.7 billion years. It's a little less than the 14 billion years that we had thought of. Now, um, the other thing I will mention is that, um, I'm just uh, trying to find the correct graph here. If we had, um, here we have the critical, the, we're, we're sitting the critical, the, um, if you have a low density universe, all right, the lines come in here a little on the younger side of the green line for the accelerating universe. And so uh, cosmologists have predicted that if we had a low density universe, that the universe would have an age of about 9 billion years. Well, that's problematical because a lot of the quasars and other deep sky objects that we have been able to see with our telescopes uh, and then figure out the ages for are coming up with dates of about 12 billion years in, in age. 
And so you have to have, based on our observations of objects in space, you have to have a theory or a hypothesis for the age of the universe that is older than the ages of these objects there, because these objects could not have been created before the universe was created. It's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario. So if you have objects that we can see in our space telescopes that are very old and have ages of about 12 billion years, then the universe has to be older than at least those objects. And so for some of these other graphs here where you have a high density, critical, low density, when you trace them back, they come in here on the slightly younger side of zero, showing an earlier date for the formation of the universe that is not supported by what we're actually seeing in space and calculating the ages for. So this curve for the accelerating universe fits quite well with our observations uh, of, of uh, deep space objects and their ages. So, you know, um, the line comes in here uh, just a little under the 14 billion years we've been quoting to date. And so the current uh, estimate for the age of the universe is sitting at about 13.7 billion years. Okay. And again, I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I got to stop doing that. I just get carried away. <laughs> so um, again, this, you know, this age estimation is consistent with other observations, particularly the age of glob globular clusters. And so uh, uh, 14 billion years ago, we had the Big Bang. 13 billion years ago, quasars formed. 10 billion years ago, the first stars formed in our galaxy. So again, any, any hypothesis we make for the formation of the universe has to fit uh, with the numbers for what we're seeing in space. Okay, and that leads us up to the last part of um, of the lecture of the cosmic microwave background. You know what, actually I'm going to go back one, I'm sorry. Um, I really should put a slide in here for the for the big finale for this. So <laughs> what have we been talking about uh, so far up to date? What is the fate of the universe? All right, we have seen that, you know, from observations, we have an accelerating universe, okay? And what that is basically telling cosmologists right now is that the universe is going to expand forever, okay? We are not looking at a situation where we're going to have a collapse of the universe back to the Big Bang. Um, we have enough matter in the universe that it's coming in um, you know, just at about the critical uh, density for the universe as, and, and we have to deal with the dark energy forces that are causing the repulsion uh, as you go farther and farther away into space. But we have this accelerating universe and right now a, a cosmologists feel that the universe will expand forever. And so if you have a universe that expands forever, um, you have to remember that that's not a closed universe and it's not an open universe, it's a flat universe. And so cosmologists do feel that the universe on, a, on a, a large scale is flat. Yes, you have dimples and curvatures of the universe to account for gravity and the curving of some space-time. We're not saying that Einstein's theory of relativity where you have curved space-time is incorrect. On smaller local scales, cosmologists feel that is certainly the way to describe things. But in terms of the universe as a whole, uh, it is a flat universe. And so, um, so that is what cosmologists feel the fate of the universe will be at this point in time. It will expand forever, that we have very close to the critical mass. We do still have some work to figure some things out, but that is uh, what we are thinking about in terms of the universe right now. All right, and so um, the cosmic, now getting back to the cosmic microwave background, um, just to kind of point this out because it was a fairly significant discovery. Um, there is, uh, as you know, a microwave is electromagnetic radiation of a certain wavelength, all right? And we're familiar with microwaves in our kitchen, but, you know, it is, again, just an EM radiation of a certain wavelength. And um, there were two engineers for Bell Laboratories in the 1960s who were trying to um, work with um, communications with or Earth orbiting satellites and trying to, um, you know, figure out uh, communications things for the for the satellite industry through Ma Bell and they um, had developed this big uh, antenna here for their radio communications 
and um, when they turned their antenna on and they were working on their experiments for the satellites um, they picked up this hiss that was always present in the background to what it was they were trying to do with the satellites and it, it's just a noise a hiss in the background um, they didn't know where it was coming from they had a lot of different explanations for it this hiss came from all directions it didn't matter where they turned this thing what orientation it was everywhere uh, all times of the day always the same volume always the same intensity always the same wavelength and they thought that maybe it was you know noise from the ground noise from the earth noise from cars noise from aircraft they even thought maybe bird poop in, inside the antenna may have been causing a problem and they swept the whole thing out and it wasn't until they had spoken to scientists at Princeton University who were trying to work on this anyway, but these guys beat them to it, that they realized that what they were hearing was sound coming from space in the microwave range that was coming from everywhere. So this noise was coming from everywhere. And so what they were detecting, you know, what the guys at Princeton thought they were detecting were photons that were left over from the Big Bang and that this machine, this um, uh, antenna was picking up. And so how this is explained is if you take a look here, again, you're familiar with these curves here. These are black body curves. All right. And so um, here we have intensity and frequency. Um, this, remember, in t as the temperature increases, the uh, height of this curve gets higher, the intensity gets higher. So this curve here represents the hottest point of the universe which would have been the Big Bang we had the big explosion and so one second after the Big Bang the wavelength that was emitted from this explosion was in the form of gamma rays and then at about 10 to the 5 years out from the Big Bang the temperature of this radiation had um, cooled off enough and because the universe was expanding this radiation also redshifted as a result so that it redshifted from gamma rays into optical waves um, at 10 to the 7th years it redshifted and cooled off even more to infrared ray waves and today it's in the form of microwaves and radio waves that we're picking it up and so again this is from the cooling um, of, of the um, radiation and the red shifting as the universe is expanding and so um, the you know black body curve corresponds to a temperature of about three degrees Kelvin which is nothing <laughs> compared to the millions of degrees Kelvin that we've been talking about with star formation and everything so um, so the reason that we are hearing the Big Bang in this cosmic radio wave uh, in the microwave um, wavelength is because of red shifting from the expansion of the universe and cooling after the Big Bang. And so it is this background microwave uh, radiation coming in from everywhere in space, uh, which they attribute back to the Big Bang. So the cosmic microwave radiation is firm observational evidence that astronomers and cosmologists have that the Big Bang actually did happen. The only way we could be picking up these uh, waves today is if 14 billion years ago you had this very energetic hot explosion that gave off gamma rays and over 14 billion years and red shifting and cooling what we're seeing today in the remnants of today, of today is this microwave slash radio uh, radiation and so if you have any doubt that the universe was created in an explosive event this cosmic microwave radiation that we are getting from everywhere in the universe no matter where we turn our radio telescopes at the same intensity 24 hours a day is proof that we need that some explosive event happened that created everything that we know about in our universe okay um, since then you know since the fellows at Bell Laboratory first discovered it we have measured it with great accuracy here we have a chart that shows the frequency the gigahertz the wavelengths Here's the intensity, okay? And this was measured by one of our satellites in space, and so it agrees very well with the theory. And so the curve is the best fit of the data corresponding to temperatures of about 3 degrees K. All right, and so, um, so we've been able to continue to measure it, okay? Now, this is an interesting diagram. This shows a map 
of the sky showing the microwave radiation in the sky. Okay, and so we have this unique pattern. You see this blue area here, and then this red area here. Oops, I'm sorry, or pink area over here, I should say. And what these differences in color represent are temperature variations. So the pink area represents a little hotter uh, or shorter wavelength radiation. The bluer areas represent a little cooler, uh, longer uh, wavelength radiation. And what this really is, a respect, uh, what you know, what the difference in the radiation here is, is not anything intrinsic to the radiation itself but it's just showing the Earth's motion through space. And so as the Earth moves towards uh, or, you know, swings around in the, you know, in its movement through space towards the radiation as it's coming in, um, it gets uh, blue shifted, if you will, and shows up in the pink spectrum. And when it gets red shifted, it shows up here on the blue color here. All right. And so what this is showing is um, the rotation, not the, the movement of the Earth itself through space. Okay, and so that's the end of our cosmology chapter. All right, and so just to summarize it up, all right, on scales larger than a few hundred megaparsecs, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Um, the universe began about 14 million years ago, 13.7, you know, if you want to be a little more exact about it, and thanks to the cosmic microwave radiation, it started off as a big bang. Um, you know, the future of the universe, you know, I left it here as either expand forever or collapse, but current ideas are that it's going to expand forever, okay, but again, there's still a lot of data and information uh, that needs to be collected, so you don't know, they may change that interpretation, it is still only a hypothesis, and so, um, you know, the density between expansion and collapse is d a critical density, and, you know, we're a little shy of it, but we're close. Um, a high density universe, remember, has a closed geometry. A critical universe is flat and a low density universe is open. Luminous mass and dark matter make up almost 30% of the critical density. And then acceleration of the universe appears to be speeding up due to some form of dark energy that we can't quite see yet. Um, we've already kind of gone over the age of the universe. And then we just finished discussing the microwave background that are photons left over from the Big Bang. Okay. So, you know, again, that's our chapter for cosmology. Um, just very interesting stuff. Uh, you know, again, the jury is still a little bit out on the future of the universe, but most cosmologists right now are pointing towards a flat universe that will expand forever. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Just stay tuned. All right, so that's, again, our last chapter for the course. Again, it was a pleasure to work with you guys through the semester. I appreciate the uh, opportunity that you gave me to introduce you to a little bit of astronomy. I hope that you learned a few things in the class, and I did try to keep it as simple as I could, uh, considering it is an introductory class. And so um, I hope to see you around campus, whether it's Pleasantville or New York City in the future. And um, I hope you all do well with your academic careers and wherever you plan on going once you graduate from college. Good luck with everything, and thank you again. It really, really was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.